Jump over a cliff, don't tell your baby daddy you're with child, and whatever you do, don't develop feelings for the next empress. Ooh, this can't end well. Vikings Valhalla Season 2 is out, and in this video we'll be taking a deep dive into its ending, the real history behind the show, and what it could mean for Season 3. So strap on in, be sure to like and subscribe, because I may not cover all the shows you're watching, but when I do... It's pretty sweet. The end of Season 2 has brought us to the coast of Pomerania, located on the Baltic Sea, bordering modern-day Poland and Germany. Olaf Haraldsson continues his quest in crushing the pagan Vikings, who have hidden away in a small town called Jomsburg. The only problem is, he isn't exactly sure where this place is, but believes God has a plan and will show him the way. And as luck would have it, his fleet stumbles upon a ship belonging to Jorinder the Exiled, but we'll get into why this coincidental meeting is so important. After the events of Season 1, Freydis Eriksdottir flees to Jomsburg, fearing for the safety of her unborn child when she finds out Olaf survived the Battle of Kattegat and will stop at nothing to have her killed. Swain Forkbeard, father of King Canute of Denmark, appoints Olaf as protector to his grandson, Prince Svein, while Forkbeard will look after Olaf's own son, Magnus. This exchange is to keep Olaf in line, for if Olaf proves to be insubordinate, it could result in the death of his son. Freydis hasn't told her baby daddy, Harald Sigurdsson, the Prince of Norway, that she is with child. She fears that Harald would raise him to be a Christian. Because I cannot have a child one day would be the ruler of a Christian nation. So the two end up going their separate ways, Harald and Leif Eriksson to Novgorod in search of an army to take back Kattegat and Freydis to Jomsburg where she believes she can peacefully have her child. It's in Jomsburg that Freydis meets Jorinder and his uncle Haraker. Haraker is based off real historical figure Harak of Tjota who led a successful peasant revolt against Olaf Haraldsson. Haraker is the leader of this small town made up of many refugees facing Christian persecution and he asks Freydis if she'd be the town's good year, or spiritual leader. In Season 1, Freydis traveled to Uppsala, the holiest site for the pagan Vikings, and received a special blade from their good year, which she'll later use in her battle against Olaf. What does it say on your sword? It says the Keeper of the Fate. Uppsala and its people were butchered by Jarl Kar at the end of Season 1, and now it's up to Freydis to continue her people's holy traditions. Harakar soon grows jealous of Freydis' growing influence and devises a plot to kill her, asking his nephew Jorinder to poison her food. Instead, Jorinder aids in her escape, but is caught doing so. His uncle even puts him on trial for the death of Freydis, even though she was never found. This is how he ends up lost in the ocean, exiled, and later picked up by Olaf. This is where things get interesting. Olaf is looking for Jomsburg and Jorinder knows where to find it. And Jorinder now has motive to join forces with Olaf to get back at his evil uncle, but what he doesn't know is that since he left, Freydis has taken back control of the town and Haraker killed by his own sister-in-law. Meanwhile, halfway across the continent, Harald and Leif are two days away from their journey to Constantinople. Harald's plea to his uncle for an army in Novgorod has fallen on deaf ears and thus he has taken on a perilous quest delivering a mysterious mysterious chess to the emperor in Constantinople, in the hopes that the payment would be enough for him to raise an army. During this journey, Leif Erikson has fallen in love with Miriam, a scholar who teaches him how to read, navigate using the stars, and use mathematics. These are tools he'll undoubtedly use when traveling to the New World. It is said Leif Erikson is the first person to land in North America almost a half millennium before Christopher Columbus. Miriam, however, suffers from an unknown illness which she succumbs to mere days before their arrival in Constantinople. Before her death, she asks him to recite the Song of Havarl, a story about a whale who emerges from the deep to see the world for a brief moment before disappearing back into the deep. It's a metaphor for their relationship. It was brief, beautiful while it lasted before one of them descends back from whence they came. She gives Leif a key to her house in Constantinople, which we'll see him hold on to as they make their way to the city's port. It'll be interesting to see what treasures await him that will help him and Harl on their journey next season. Jorinder divulges Jomsburg's weakness, the main sentinel which could potentially destroy their ships should they make an attack by sea. If they take out the sentinel, the city will be defenseless. Olaf asks for a parley, bringing along Jorinder who finds out Haraker is dead and Freydis has taken back control. Unbeknownst to Olaf, Jorinder's mother gives him a message from Freydis to lure Olaf's men into the harbor. She gives him back his necklace which was taken from him after being exiled, a 
symbol that he is forgiven. Meanwhile, in London, Queen Emma and Earl Godwin continue their game of cat and mouse. The Queen believes Godwin complicit in an attempt to assassinate her, even going so far as to torture his fiancée to death in the hopes of getting a confession. Unfortunately for the Queen, when her husband King Canute arrives back in town and hears of this situation, he offers Godwin his niece Geetha to marry to make up for this terrible mistake. Here is where things get spicy. Emma believes Godwin wanted this all along, that he planned the assassination, wanted his fiancée to die, and to be given Geetha as a bride because that would get him one step closer to his dream, fathering children that would one day become kings. Geetha is of royal blood, but his ex-fiancé Elfwyn, who died, was not. This is why the queen gives Geetha a ring necklace as a wedding present and asks her to wear it every day. This ring belonged to Godwin's guardian, John the Bear Fletcher. But how did such a valuable ring come into the hands of a simple farmer? It's implied here that this ring was a gift from Godwin, and Godwin charged the man with hiring the assassin and later killed him to cover his tracks. Therefore, giving the ring to Geetha is the queen's way of telling Godwin Godwin, I know what you've done. Godwin's dream of his son becoming king became a reality in 1066 when his son Harold Godwinson became king of England, only later to be killed in the Norman Conquest. But for season 3, expect Queen Emma and Godwin to further butt heads. Back at the War Council, Jorunder advises Olaf not to attack, but he believes with God on his side, they are sure to win. They attack the main sentinel and Jorunder betrays Olaf and his men, joining sides with the people but dying in the process. His last words are to tell his mother he was not a traitor. Near Constantinople, Harold and Elena have developed feelings for one another, but Harold is in for one hell of a shock when he discovers it's not the treasure necklace he was to bring to the Emperor, but Elena herself. She is to wed the Emperor. For bringing her safely to him, the Emperor grants Harold anything he wishes, so it looks like he may be getting that army after all. Remember he told his uncle in episode 3, When I return, I will be a rich and powerful man, with my own army and a purpose. What will undoubtedly get in the way of that is this budding relationship between him and the Emperor's bride. But when he tells her she's now out of his reach, she says, Nothing is out of your reach. And Harold's gotta be like, so you're telling me there's a chance. Even though the main sentinel is still operable, the Yom's Vikings allow Olaf's fleet safe passage into the harbor. This is all part of Freydis' plan. She's planted dozens of jars of oil underneath the harbor that, when opened and set aflame, will completely decimate Olaf's fleet. Luckily, Olaf and Prince Vane make it to land before the attack, and the season's climax sees Freydis and Olaf in a one-on-one -on -one battle for control of Yomsburg. Eventually, Freydis gets the upper hand and Olaf is killed. Killed, believing he's made himself to be a martyr, and his name will be remembered for all of eternity. But Freydis is like, But who is left to tell your story? In reality, Olaf was killed in the Battle of Stickelstad in 1030. A year later, he'd be named a saint by the Pope for his work in spreading Christianity. A bit ironic considering that involved killing thousands of people. Now, Freydis could have easily killed the young prince, but instead travels back to Kattegat and offers him to his mother, the Queen of Denmark, as a peace offering which this queen accepts. This completes Freydis' character arc this season. In episode 1, she did not accept her destiny as Keeper of the Faith. You're Freydis, the Keeper of the Faith, aren't you? I, I don't know who you mean. But by the end of the season, she has fully embraced it. You are Freydis, aren't you? The Keeper of the Faith. Yes. I am. Vikings Valhalla Season 3 started filming mid-2022, so expect an early 2024 release for Season 3. And although nothing has been confirmed beyond Season 3, creator Jeb Stewart says he has plans to continue the Viking saga until the end of the Viking era around 1066 AD. So there's still a lot more story to tell. But what did you think of Vikings Valhalla? I want to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Thanks for watching, be sure to like and subscribe, and for more bad takes you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, so you're telling me there's a chance.